let's see uh, another way, uh, another way of thinking about the norms that indicates how these alternative norms uh, are useful. Um, and in fact, uh, we're going to see how, uh, we're going to see something that links up uh, these various norms in RN that shows how they're kind of related to one another, not just this little simple geometric diagram I, I had here. And that's going to involve looking at the open sets in RN. And if we're going to be looking at the open sets in RN, then we're, in effect, going to be looking at epsilon balls, because remember that we defined a set to be open in terms of uh, epsilon balls about its points, about the set's points. So first, let's look at uh, how the, what the epsilon ball or a circle looks like in using each of these norms. So let's start by uh, just drawing a circle here. I'm not really all that good at drawing circles, but that one came out pretty good. And so I want to draw an axis that's supposed to go right through the middle. That kind of is in, going a little bit uphill, but I think it'll be okay. And let's draw another one here. And I'm trying to be careful about the way I draw them because the next thing I'm going to do uh, will look funny if I don't draw this pretty accurately. Okay, so the A. An epsilon ball is just the stuff inside a circle like this. I've drawn this circle so that it's centered at the origin, the zero vector, but of course the same thing will be true if the circle was sitting elsewhere. And how big is the circle? Well, let's just make it the unit circle here. That'll make things easy to work with. But of course, uh, the epsilon ball, the epsilon circle, would just be the circle but multiplied by epsilon. If epsilon's small, it's going to be smaller. Epsilon's big, it'll be bigger. So this is the unit circle, and in fact, let's even write down here that this is the set of all x in R, and I'm going to write Rn, but of course, I'm drawing this in R2, so n is 2 in this particular picture here, where the norm of x is equal to 1. All right? And that's the circle uh, where the norm is equal to 1 if it's the Euclidean norm. So, the Euclidean norm. Okay, but now let's ask, well, what does the norm, what does the unit circle look like, let's say, in the max norm? Well, it's easy to see, you can see that, and just think about it for yourself, that the, all of the, in fact, so what I'm doing here is I'm saying, Let's change this to the max norm, okay? And so uh, it's easy to see that the all of the vectors in R2 whose distance from the origin is 1 in this norm are, again, let me try to draw this carefully. Doing the best I can here. That square, going out to 1, 1, minus 1, and minus 1, that square is the unit circle. Of course, it's not a circle, it's a square. But that is the set, that's the set. That's the set of all vectors uh, whose distance from the zero vector is exactly 1. What about the uh, city block norm? The, all the vectors that have dis that are exactly one unit in the city block norm from the zero vector is all the things on this pink square tilted onto a corner. And so you see that uh, each of these norms, the, the, the unit circle, which is not a circle in, except in this norm here, uh, is a different shaped set. And in fact, that reminds me of something that I actually meant to do, so let me actually do this right here as kind of an aside. I'm going to write in here yet another norm. I'm going to write in here a norm 
uh, with a P down here. And this is going to be the uh, this is going to be uh, a norm. Um, uh, so that's going to be, uh, I take each component and I raise it to the p power. And then I take the sum of those components raised to the p power and I take the pth root so I, to the 1 over p power. And this is, I do this for any p, whoop, it's supposed to be greater than, for any p greater than or equal to 1. That's called the LP norm. So what I've done here is I've actually defined yet a, a fourth norm, but in fact, a whole continuum of norms, because for any p greater than or equal to 1, this is well-defined, and we can show, of course, just saying it's well-defined, that we actually do get a, uh, we actually do have a function from Rn that assigns just non-negative real numbers, which this kind of clearly does. Uh, that's not enough to say it's a norm. We have to actually prove that it, we have to prove that it satisfies the, the conditions n1 to n4. And once we prove that, then we know this is a norm too. So for example, the distance theorem applies, and any other theorem that we can prove about norms applies here too. And so I've put this in here partly just to point out that there are lots more norms on Rn, at least, and we're going to see norms on other vector spaces besides Rn. Lots more norms on Rn, an infinity of them even. And this would provide a, a good little exercise to see what does, what does the set here, I guess I didn't write in the one for, the pink one for, for this norm here, but now what does the set, uh, let me make this pink here though, what does the set, when that's a P, what does that look like in here? And so you should do as a kind of an exercise, uh, let's say for P, we, oh, back up a little bit here. <laughs> I didn't point this out. Notice that when P is 1, this is exactly, this, the LP norm is exactly the, uh, the city block norm. Because now I've got each of the P's is 1, so this goes across, it's just the, the sum of the absolute values of the components, and it's the first root, not, not a root, okay? And when P is 2, it's exactly this norm here. So each of these two norms is an obvious special case of the LP norm. And this is a sort of special case too. Infinity is not a number. Uh, so uh, I can't say x1 to the infinite power and then take the infinite root. But it is the limit in a kind of a well-defined way of this norm as P goes to infinity. And so I think it would be a good exercise to say, let's, we already know what th this set looks like when P is 1 and when P is 2. When P is 1, it is the pink figure. When P is 2, it is the circle. And what about when P is 3? So it would be a good exercise now for you to trace out what the unit circle, not exactly a circle, looks like when P is 3, and that will give you some idea of what's going on as P gets bigger and bigger and may go all the way out uh, toward infinity. Okay, so that was kind of a little aside here. And so the reason I did uh, this, the reason we did this was because uh, if we're going to be talking about open sets, as we're going to do in just a second, if we're going to be talking about open sets, and then we're going to be talking about epsilon balls, well, the epsilon ball is defined in terms of the norm, and so the epsilon ball's shape is going to look like this. It's going to be the inside of one of these figures, depending on the norm we're talking about. So let's now go over here, and uh, let's uh, look at our notion of an open set. So we say... 
um, a set in Rn, a subset of Rn, is open if Well, let's say it in words. Sets open if there is an epsilon ball about each of its points where the epsilon ball is completely contained in S. So writing that out formally, it says for every point in S, I'll call it X bar, there exists an epsilon ball, and this really means there exists an epsilon, such that the epsilon ball around x bar of radius epsilon is a subset of S. That was our definition. In fact, I could have written definition. That is the definition that we wrote when we talked about open sets. Now, what I want to do here is I'm going to rewrite this as follows. I'm going to say instead of this, I'm just going to cross that. It's not wrong. I'm going to cross it out. I'm going to replace it with the set of all x in Rn, the set of vectors in Rn, such that the norm of x minus, the distance between x and x bar is less than epsilon is a subset of S. So this is the same statement. It's just that I'm writing out the ball about x bar radius epsilon in detail instead of this. And the reason I'm doing that is because here, the norm doesn't actually show up explicitly. It's inside, it's built into the ball, <laughs> the definition of the ball. But here, the norm appears explicitly so we can actually talk about how the epsilon ball depends on the norm. Okay, so now we have a problem, it appears, and that is that we did this definition for the Euclidean norm, and now we find that if we use a different norm, this definition is going to give us something different because the norm will be different. So the, the epsilon ball around x bar will have a different shape, different size in a sense. They'll all have radius epsilon, but different set. Okay, Everything inside the circle, everything inside the orange square, everything inside the pink square, different. We different sets. So this, this actually looks like a problem uh, for our whole notion of open sets, and we use open sets uh, when we, for example, talk about continuity of functions, which we're going to do very shortly. Uh, we want to prove that a function is continuous. Uh, we do it, one of the ways we do it is in terms of open sets, I implicitly and sometimes explicitly in terms of norm. Uh, when we want to talk about convergence of sequences, we prove that a sequence converges to some limit uh, using one of the ways we do it is to use open sets. So again, sometimes we explicitly use a norm, but either way, if things depend on the norm, and these norms give us different sets, well, we seem to have a problem. So let's see how that goes. Let me do one more thing here, and let's say I've just indicated that if I change the norm, it's going to change what's open. So let's say a set is open with respect to, I don't know if I've used this abbreviation before, WRT is such a shorthand for with respect to. A set is open with respect to the norm, a particular norm, if uh, for every point in the set S, there exists an epsilon ball in that norm about the point that's a subset of S. So I could, for example, let's just put a P down here, even though this works, this works not just for the LP norm and the special cases, it works for any norm. So I'm just going to use P. In fact, let me, let me, instead of using P, let's just use an A. So the A could be anything to designate this, to designate this norm, to give the, no, the norm its own name. Okay? 
So it's open with it's open with respect to some particular norm. If and now I could write a little a down here. The epsilon ball this is so tiny you can probably already see it on the, on the screen here. Uh, but here I'll make it bigger. Okay, so a set is open with respect to a particular norm if for any point in the set there is uh, an epsilon ball defined by that norm about x bar that's entirely a subset of s. So as I said, this looks like a problem. But in fact, it's just the opposite. It's actually not a problem. It's actually great. It actually turns out to be extremely useful. And so let's see why. And the why is going to come from the following theorem. If this is a norm, and this is another norm, on Rn. So that's important because when we generalized all this by elevating the, uh, by elevating our four properties n1 to n4 to a definition, we elevated that to a definition about a norm on any vector space. And what we're doing here only applies to norms on Rn, right? So we'd apply to all of these norms here because they're all defined on Rn. So if we have two norms on Rn, then a set is open with respect to the A norm if and only if it is open with respect to the B norm. So this theorem tells us that this isn't such a problem after all. Because while the sets look different, have different shapes, what sets are open, what, wh which are the open sets uh, in Rn, doesn't depend on the norm. Any norm, any of these norms or any other norm that we could define on Rn, and there are other norms we could define on Rn, any norm that we define on Rn is going to generate the exact same collection of open sets. The same sets will be the open sets, whether we use the circle, the orange square, the pink square, or you know, when p is 3, whatever that set is, doesn't matter. The same sets will be the open sets. That actually is easy to prove. It's an exercise that I'll give you uh, to do after today's lecture, in fact. Okay, so, so that turns out to be useful. I've indicated it's useful, but I haven't said how or why it's useful. So here's one way that this is actually a useful fact, and that is that when we want to prove that a function's continuous, I indicated a few moments ago that we do that. One of the ways we do that is by working with open sets. And uh, we want to prove that a function is not continuous. Again, we use open sets. And it turns out that if our open sets are defined by this norm, the arithmetic is often very messy to do because we're working with square roots and that can be problematical for the arithmetic. We can do it, but it can be messy. And there are lots of situations where instead we can use this norm, and sometimes this norm, but more often it's this one, where we can use this norm and the open sets defined by this norm, which of course are the same as the open sets defined by the others, you can use this norm to work with the open sets, and the arithmetic is a lot easier with this norm here. Uh, so that is uh, a way that this turns out to be very useful. Sometimes actually this norm is the easiest one to use. And, oh, and I said that about continuous functions proving that a function is continuous or not. You recall a few moments ago, I mentioned that also uh, showing 
whether a sequence converges or not to a given point also uses open sets as one of the ways we deal with convergence and we try to work with convergence. And again, same thing. This can be awkward to use uh, the arithmetic, the algebra can be awkward with this norm and it can be sometimes very straightforward with this norm here. So just one of the ways that this, the idea of multiple norms and this result about those norms in Rn can be indeed uh, pretty useful.